welcome to No Walls. As you can see, everybody's not abiding by the that these are being obedient. Welcome to No Walls. This is my first but never in video. The camp. So this is going to be a new experience. Um, again. Hi guys, welcome back to No Walls. I'm so excited to have each of you worshiping with us this Sunday. And happy Sunday goes out to all of my sailors and to those of you serving in the military uh, and your families. We really do appreciate everything that you do in times of war and in times of peace. And happy Sunday goes out to all of the youth, the young adults, and those of you of wisdom. Um, I'm going to jump right into the Word of God today. I am really excited about it. It's a, it's a uh, interesting, <laughs> it's a very interesting Word from God. Um, I don't know how it will bless you. Um, normally I can say, oh, I know who this is for. I don't. Uh, so I, I just hope that it blesses you. And if it's not for you, I pray that it is for, um, it's a message that you can share with others to help them. Uh, we definitely want to be growing in Christ. Um, today's passage of scripture is extremely familiar. Um, it's about our parents. Uh, we will be coming out of the book of Genesis. Our parents, Adam and Eve. Uh, Genesis 3, and we're going to do verses 8 through 13. So Genesis 3, verses 8 through 13. And it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you... <laughs> the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Uh, that's Genesis 3 verses 8 through 13. Genesis 3, 8 through 13. And today's message is naked and afraid. <laughs> naked and afraid. Um, he actually gave me the title uh, of today's sermon, and I was clueless. Um, I've heard that before, and I was like, Naked and Afraid, isn't that a TV show? <laughs> but but it wouldn't go away, Naked and Afraid, Naked and Afraid. I, I wrote it down, I put it in my phone, okay, Naked and Afraid, I don't really get it, but anyway. So I go and I look up the TV show, um, and yes, it is a reality TV show, uh, Naked and Afraid, uh, is a reality TV show uh, where they uh, literally drop a one man and one woman off in the middle of nowhere. Now, I'm not talking about in the middle of civilization where there's houses and stores and cars. I'm talking about in the middle of absolutely nowhere with one personal item. They can bring one item. Um, and they are literally, I'm not talking about bikini. I'm not talking about leave. I'm talking about they are literally, completely naked when this happens. So one man, one woman dropped off in the middle of nowhere. And the question is, can they survive? Um, they can become friends and work together to survive. Hopefully they don't have any arguments or disagreements. And you know, maybe one is better at building, one is better at cooking or finding food or affording food or being clever. Like, whatever it is, Naked and Afraid is literally this TV show, this reality show that puts... And they're not husband and wife. <laughs> so, um, they're complete strangers. And, you know, to that benefit, you know, if you drop someone off with their husband and wife, it's just a wrap. That's not going to work. <laughs> I'm already afraid and they put me on this island with you, you know, like you already have your issues at home. Why put me out? <laughs> Why put me in the middle of nowhere? Um, I thought immediately, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Who, and I'm not saying it to be disrespectful, but who in their right mind? A would create the show. <laughs> who would support this show? And who would actually sign up for the show? That just 
that make, it makes no sense to me. Like I don't get it. And uh, so what I did was I um, was like, oh, I get it. I mean, I know what would persuade a person, not me. Um, a million dollars. You know, if you are in need of a million dollars um, after taxes, you're still gonna probably end up with like six hundred thousand dollars, at least two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We know in your pocket after everything is paid, taxes, everything. You know what? I could kind of see somebody in a desperate situation saying, look, I'm going to sign up for this show. And if I can survive, you know, then they're going to give me this money and it's going to help us out. Again, me, no. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Would never. <laughs> um, and so I go to look to see, you know, uh, are, are, is there another couple that's dropped off in a different remote location? And it's like the last couple standing, last person standing. Um, no, nope, there's no other teams. It's just the two of them. And it's not the last man standing gets a million dollars. The prize, and it says it. Y'all can please go look it up. Do not trust me on this. It literally says the prize is, there's no prize money, but the true prize is the survivor's pride and sense of self-accomplishment. Wait, <laughs> wait, y'all created, <laughs> this was me, like I literally had to read it again, I was like, wait, so somebody was sitting there and said, I got a great idea, let's put a man and a woman, two strangers together in the middle of nowhere without clothes, they get one personal item and then they have to survive in the middle of nowhere, find their own food, their own lodging, their own, you got to survive from bug bites and all that stuff, like, and the only thing you win is your pride and sense <laughs> of self-accomplishment what i was like there's no way first of all <laughs> no one's gonna sign up for this and if they do you know after you watch the first one that's pretty much it i kid y'all not 15 seasons <laughs> I was like, huh? <laughs> Wait, like, I hate to keep repeating myself. In my brain cells, I'm thinking, who would leave the comforts of their home? I'm not talking about a rich home. I'm not talking about you have all these luxuries. I'm not talking about you drive a Bentley. I'm talking about you have a car that gets you to po from point A to point B. You have a bed that is comfortable. It doesn't matter if it's a twin size and you're sharing it with somebody. You still have a bed to lay in. You have a roof over your head. Even if it leaks in the den, there's still a place in your house with a roof over you. Like, you may, you may have to be on food stamps because that's just where you are in your life, but still you have a way to get food. Um, who would give up those comforts, the goodness of this life, this, to be dropped off in the middle of nowhere and see if you can survive so that you can win pride <laughs> and so you can win a, a sense of self-accomplishment. <sighs> and then the Lord was like, look in Genesis. It's been done before. I was like, no. <laughs> what? God is literally like, listen. In the middle of nowhere. In the middle of somewhere. In the middle of my blessing. In the middle of my new creation. I dropped off two people that did not know each other. First Adam. And then I created Eve. And I told them you can have everything. Everything is yours. As a matter of fact, before Eve got here, I told Adam, listen, these animals are going <laughs> these animals are going to walk through and you're going to name every last one of them. They're not going to harm you. Uh they're going to be under your rule, under your dominion. You'll tell them everything. You'll control them. They're they're yours. They're they're yours. I'm clear. Um and when he saw that every animal had was male and female, so every male had a female, every female had a male, like everybody had a companion. He was like, even though Adam is happy, even though Adam has not asked me, even though Adam is not complaining, I want to do this. I want to give him someone so that he is not alone because he just, 
it's not good for man to be alone. So he puts him into a deep sleep. And uh, the Bible tells us that everything is made from the dust except one thing, and that's a woman. She's taken from Adam's rib. And, uh, of course, I'm sure Adam is happy. She has, she's the opposite of him. Everything he has, she has the opposite. Like, say, that, that is your helper. That is your sidekick. That is your person. That is your rod or die. That's her. You get Eve. The Bible says that after he created Eve, in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 25, I believe, verse 25. Chapter 2, verse 25. The Bible says, after he created Eve, it says, they were naked and not ashamed. So put a pen in that right there. Verse 25 in chapter 2 says that they were naked. So they naked, but they're not afraid. They're not afraid. They're not ashamed. They're not anything. They're unashamed. They're happy. They have peace. They have everything. They're being blessed. They have a relationship with the Creator. They have each other. They have everything. They they do not want for anything. Remember what I asked you about this TV show? Who would leave the comforts of their home to go into this nonsense? And here our parents, Adam and Eve, did just that. They gave up the comforts for nonsense. Uh, and ironically, probably for pride and <laughs> a sense of self-accomplishment. <laughs> um, we're told that a serpent uh, came to Eve. Um, listen, uh, husband and wives, we've talked about it before. you got to be equally yoked. Um, and you've got to be yoked together. It says, you know, uh, a man and a woman that you're going to leave your home. You're going to cleave together. You're not going to cleave to your parents who's going to cleave to your aunties. And you're like, like, no, you cleave together. Imagine if Adam had stayed with Eve. Imagine if they had been on one accord. Imagine if she didn't just go to the grocery store. Imagine if she had said, hey, husband, I'm leaving to go to the grocery store. Is there anything that you need? Because maybe he stopped by and bought a bunch of stuff and you bought and you come home and you've over purchased because y'all went on one accord. Y'all didn't talk. Got to be on one accord. You got to agree. You can't just have one person making a decision. It's one thing that I'm learning. One thing that God is growing me in as I enter into a new relationship is, wait a minute. You can't do things by yourself. You cannot make a decision by yourself. No matter what. You, you may have been making this decision by yourself. It may just be like, well, I want to get apples and not bananas. You know what? Ask. Still ask. Share. Be a part of one another's lives. If I have a car, it belongs to <laughs> my husband. If he has a car, it belongs to me. Like, like we, we don't, you don't have separate things. You, you are one. And had Eve not been over here close to this other tree, she probably, we probably wouldn't even be in this predicament. But she was separated from her husband. You don't say this is, this, and if you do, you're wrong. <laughs> this is my house and these three rooms are mine. It's like, no, it's ours. When you said I do, when you made that commitment and that promise, and I hope this helps young people too, because don't be jumping in these marriages and relationships if you don't understand. You are no longer by yourself. You have to understand when you're asking God for, for a husband, when you are asking God for a wife, when you are asking God for these things, you have to make sure that you are prepared to handle what it requires. And it requires for you all to be one. Like my hand, my right hand <laughs> cannot go to the store. Unless my left hand is going. I can't be like, well, left hand, you stay here while I go. Like, like, like my, I'm one. I'm one person. And when you cleave, when you get married, when you are entering into these relationships, everybody wants to be married. Everybody wants bridesmaids. Everybody wants all this other stuff. But listen, it is a covenant and a commitment and you become one. My fiance, it is, there's no, is everything is our. Every time he talks, he's like, well, our is this and I, your name is not on <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm thinking but he, but he 
has really made me go. It is ours. When you become one, you got to be one. And here Eve is somewhere else apart from her husband. He doesn't know that she's talking to a serpent. He doesn't know she's being whatever. She's apart. She's out from under the covering of who God put in charge of everything. Um, so here we are. And the devil does what he does best. Um, first of all, if I see a talking animal, it don't even have to be a snake. <laughs> I'm gone. That's why Bible says, listen, run from sin. Like, like run. Like we should run away from it. But there she stood listening to whatever he, it is he had to say. And here we are today uh, having pain in childbirth and uh, suffering a lot and being sinful a lot. And after they eat of the fruit, they, the Bible says their eyes were open. They were naked and ashamed they were also afraid they were so afraid that they hid from god they they sold leaves they made their little outfits their little clothes uh and they hid from god and so i just kind of wanted to take a look at in my mind who <laughs> who would be who would take a chance on being naked and afraid and so god showed me that it could be me and that sometimes uh, I step out of the grace of God. And sometimes I step from under the covering. And sometimes I take off the clothes of righteousness. Uh, and, and I take a chance on being naked and afraid. Um, so the first mistake, the first thing uh, that Eve allows or does is, for a lot of us, she has this thirst and this desire to obtain listen unnecessary knowledge the first <laughs> the first thing that happens is she has a desire to gain knowledge that is not necessary why does she need to know everything you have everything and everything is good. You have everything. What else do you need to know? We call it modern day. We don't say you have this thirst or this quest for knowledge. Un that's unnecessary knowledge. We just call it nosy. And <laughs> she was literally nosy. Some of us, the enemy has convinced us to be nosy people and because he was nosy she was desiring information and knowledge that she did not need what does she need to know more importantly why one thing i've learned in my in my life and it took a whole bunch of nonsense to happen for me to understand it is i don't tell all of my business and i certainly don't tell it to everybody People will say, oh, oh my goodness, is everything okay? What happened? Now, there are some people that are asking me that because they want to pray for me. They want to help me. They want to do something for me. They want to um, help me get out. They want to fix it. They want, you know, there's good behind there. What happened? What can I do? There are some people that go, I mean, like, what happened? They want that knowledge. Not because they want to lay it at the feet of God. They want to lay it at the feet of Sarah and Sasha. And <laughs> talk about me. If they don't want to talk about me, it makes them feel good that something horrible is going on in my life. And here Eve is listening to the enemy. And she has a desire to gain unnecessary knowledge. Listen, unnecessary knowledge... Uh, will cause us to sin horribly. First thing that it'll do is cause us to judge people. She's pregnant? Wait a minute, by who? That's unnecessary. You, why do you gotta know? Why do you, are you gonna buy, <laughs> are you gonna buy her some baby? Like, like there's information that we desire. Then what happens is we switch over to judge mode. I knew it. 
I told y'all, like, like knowing some things that we don't have a need to know causes us to judge. And the word of God says, judge not so that you don't get judged. Sin. It told us don't be murmuring. There should not be murmuring among the believers. Well, when you thirst for, strive for, try to obtain, ask all these questions, it leads to murmuring among the brethren. It leads to people talking about things that have nothing to do with the It has absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom. If you're not going to be praying for someone, if you're not going to be praying against the wiles of the enemy, you don't need to know. Gaining that kind of knowledge benefits no one. And that was Eve's problem. She wanted to know everything. She wanted this power to know everything. Sometimes people know, want to know, well, just tell me what happened. You know why? You know what happens after they give, you give them a little bit of information? Their imaginations go wild. And then they start inventing conversations that never took place. They start, oh, I bet they over there. And they not. I know they're, they're talking, but they not. <laughs> like like so the more knowledge you have that's not necessary for your spiritual growth for your life we should not desire it because that's one way that the enemy sneaks in listen to what he did listen to how clever the enemy is he told he is uh he's the father of lies and we've been told that but look at how clever he is he did it to jesus he did it to to eve and he will do it to you. Jesus knew the scripture. So Jesus was like, mm -mm, the word of God says you cannot tempt the Lord your God. Like, you know, he was able to give scriptures back. But Eve, Eve, this is what he told Eve. Hey, God told you not to eat of that tree. Y'all, that's a fact. She says, yes, you're right. You are right. He told the truth. This is how we get captured. Second truth, he says, you know why? Because then your eyes will be opened and you will have more knowledge. Guess what? That's true. That is very true. But the third thing he said was not the truth. It was a story. It was an untruth. It was a fib. <laughs> it was a lie. <laughs> he said, the third thing is, then you will be more powerful than God. You will know more than God. You will become a God. And he does not want that for you. And that was the lie. Haven't y'all ever heard of that game where they say, uh, tell two truths and one lie. And let's see which one is the lie. You know, or let's see. Yeah. Well, the devil played that game and Eve failed. She thought all of them were the truth and they were not. He didn't want their eyes opened because they were blessed. He wanted them to enjoy the blessing. God literally wants you to not be so consumed with tomorrow that you don't see the trees today. Did you even thank him that if you went, you inhaled that he blessed you with oxygen today? Like, did you even thank him for that? Like he's saying, listen, I made today and I want you to rejoice and be glad in today. But we're so worried about tomorrow and we're so worried about all these other things. He's like, listen, I don't want you to know everything. I want you to enjoy me. I don't want you to worry about your cares. I want you to cast your cares upon me because I care for you. And here Eve is, just like many of us, just like me. You hear two truths and one lie. And the whole thing, instead of us saying, well, the lie cancels out, <laughs> cancels everything out. What we do is we listen to the enemy and he reels us in with the truth and then tricks us with the lie. Uh, yeah, so, so, so her nosiness, her quest for um, unnecessary knowledge uh, got her where she is. Um, the second thing is she was what we call playing with fire. Um, I hear this and y'all probably hear this all the time. I mean, you know, the enemy, the enemy made me, uh, say that the enemy made me think that the enemy, 
<laughs> we be like giving him credit that he does not deserve. Like she literally stood there. And after he spoke the first time, she should have run. She didn't. She stayed right there. She was flirting with the enemy. She was playing with fire. Yeah, you're going to get burned if you keep playing with it. And she stood right there like so many of us. We know it's wrong, but we stay there. The longer you hang around, the more you flirt. That's our proverb. Say, listen, do not <laughs> be tempted by wine. Uh, look at in Proverbs, do not be tempted by wine just because it's really pretty red. He's trying to tell you it's a trap. He's trying to show you how subtle the enemy is. You can't get drunk, just have one. Just go have it with breakfast. It's not that big for the age 21. You can. It's not illegal. If it's not illegal, it's not a sin. That's what the enemy has convinced us of. And so we start doing these little things, and I'm not judging anybody. I'm just giving a simple example. Um, and so... We begin to subtly sit there and say, listen, I'm going to make it plain today. Just hear me out. The devil can tempt you. The enemy can. He can persuade you. Um, he can lie to you. He can deceive you. But he cannot force you to do anything. And there she stood playing with fire being persuaded, being deceived, being tricked, being lied to. And when he finished talking, she had a decision to make. He didn't force her to do it. I don't care what she said. <laughs> In the end, she made her own choice. He gave them a way of escape. He said, you don't have to eat of this tree. Look at all these other trees. They're all good. They're all good to you. The Bible says all those other trees were pleasing to the eyes. So it's not like this one looked better than the others. That tree was just forbidden. You cannot. The devil does not make us. We have a choice to make. And she listened. She listened to the serpent. And she followed the persuasion of the serpent. And she made a choice. Um, and she did it. Uh, we don't see anywhere where the serpent had arms and was like, you're going to take this apple <laughs> and shoved it into her mouth. She took it. It doesn't say he gave it to her. It says she took it and she ate it. And then she did something that so many of us do. Hurt people, hurt people. If I'm going down, everybody's going down. My friend Stephanie, uh, she used to, if I would spend the night with her at her house and she couldn't sleep and she would wake up early in the morning, she would start tapping me on my shoulder. Girl, what you doing? She was like, if, <laughs> if I'm going to be awake, everybody got to be awake. And that is not the rule. <laughs> and she would wake me up like, come on, time to start today. Like, you know, and there are people like that. They're like, let me tell you what I've had to suffer through. And if I, 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 then you got to suffer too. What? That's that Eve mentality. As believers, I, I will, yeah, I may be persecuted. I may have to suffer, but I'm going to protect you from it. I'm not going to lead you down the path that I went. I'm not going to, I sinned, I messed up. I'm not going to get you to do the same thing so that I can say, well, we're both sinners. Punish us both. There's so many people that are like that. Let me tell you what I do. And if you, I'm going to tell you right now, if you are doing everything right, I want you to really, because this keeps flaring its ugly head. If you find in your life that everybody is corrected by you, but nobody can correct you, there's a problem. You're naked and afraid, and the only prize you're after is pride. I want you to search yourself. If you cannot consider being corrected, and everybody else is wrong except you, you're, the prize you're looking for is self-accomplishment and pride. And the Bible says God opposes the proud. And it says that uh, pride comes before the fall. Yeah. Um, and so 
here Eve is, instead of saying, Adam, help me. I've sinned. Go get God. I need to be cleansed. Help me out. I need to get this, this fruit out of my body. Instead of her running to her husband for prayer. Women, men, instead of going and asking your spouse to pray. Spouses, instead of partaking in the sin too, well, okay, well, if you did it, then I'll do it. We got to be praying for each other. We can't be bringing other people down just so that we're not in trouble by ourselves. We can't be trying to hold other people down just to make ourselves look better. And Eve went straight for her husband, good, but she didn't go to her husband for prayer. She didn't go to her husband for help. She didn't go to her husband and said, I need you to call on God so that I can ask him to forgive me. No, she said, here. Eat this. And when he ate, the Bible says their eyes were open. Their eyes being opened, uh, they immediately hid themselves with fig leaves. They covered up what, what's been naked this whole time physically. Physically, they covered themselves. And then physically, because covering wasn't enough, they went and hid. That's what sin does to us. Sin makes us cover ourselves to make ourselves look like, you know, we got everything together. Uh, so that we're not ashamed, so that we're not embarrassed. And then the second thing we start to do is hiding from God. Um, two things. Uh, they were already naked, as I told you in chapter 2, verse 25. It says that... After he made them, after he created them, uh, it says they were naked and unashamed. They didn't know. They had no idea. They, had, they didn't have that knowledge. They didn't care. It didn't bother them that they were exposed before God, that he knew everything about him, that he could see them, that he loved them for the way they were. He loved them as they were. But then they sinned. And when they sinned, they realize, not so much that I'm physically naked, but I have stripped myself of the honor uh, of being so close to God, of being obedient to God, of pleasing God, of showing my faith, of showing my love and my faithfulness to my Creator. And so when they hid, He said, "Hey, where are y'all? Like they could really hide from God." And and He says, "We're over here." And he says, we know why you're over here. And he's like, listen, it's because we're naked. And and God asked the craziest thing. Because God is like, y'all been naked. <laughs> Who told you? Who told you that you were naked? How would you know that? Did you eat of the fruit? This father, uh, his daughter, um, every time something would hurt her, no matter what it is, she would be like, Daddy, and you know, she's like, I need a band-aid. He would put band-aid on whatever it was. Every time, without fail. Most times <laughs> it was invisible. Couldn't see it. No blood, no scratch, no nothing. And she would come running into her father's loving arms. He'd be like, Come on. He go get a band-aid. Put on thing. She just, you know, kinda like a little pouty, sweet little y'all know. Y'all know. It's funny because my daughter, uh, Ryan, who's probably going to kill me if she ever finds out I told this story. I don't think she watches No Walls, which is great. <laughs> She's part of a ministry, so I'm praying. If she does watch, she don't watch this one. She actually attends in person. I don't know if she's watched since she's been in Ohio. But uh, when she was little, she had this thing. She loved stickers. She loved really girly things. And so one day, uh, we made the fatal mistake of buying uh, cute stickers for uh, a little scratch she had. I went to the store and I didn't buy, you know, the beige ones, the pink ones. <laughs> I bought the character ones. So I don't know. I had some Disney princess on it or Lilo and Stitch or somebody on, was on it. And I'm like, yeah, look, it's all better. And she looked, she's like, oh, that's pretty. I'm like, yeah, real pretty. Good. Problem solved. But then almost every day, 
if she got hurt, even if there was no outward appearance of one, if she legitimately fell and there's no scar to scratch, she'd be like, look, I fell right here. And she would point to something on, on her body and I'd put it. Then after a while, she'd be like, I think I need a Band-Aid right here. And I'm like, there's nothing on you. She's like, right here. Nothing, y'all. Perfect forehead. Beautiful. And she was going to daycare at the time. Uh, so one day, my aunt pulled me aside and she was like, hey, let's come on. I want to talk to you for a minute. I was like, okay. She was like, um, you know, I would never uh, report you without first getting the facts from you. But I just need to know. Ryan's got a lot of injuries. I said, if you don't take them, <laughs> those are stickers. <laughs> they're band-aids. <laughs> but for her, they're stickers. She's like, there's nothing under them. You can take, tomorrow when she come in, take all of them off. I'll bring you another box. You can put a whole bunch back. There ain't nothing wrong with that girl. Sure enough, she took them off and was like, I thought something was wrong with you. You know, she took the band-aids off. And then eventually, I don't know, at some point, Ryan grew out of the band-aids. But this father was basically experiencing <laughs> the same thing I was. Um, and, you know, he, he went along with it because it was their moment. It was him being the hero. It was my daddy is, you know, my comfort. My daddy is the one that will make sure that I'm okay. And so they had this little thing every time without fail. She would run to daddy. Uh, so she started going to school, uh, uh, you know, I guess age four, age five. And, and then one day they were at home and she hurt herself. Now he knew. If she hurt herself, it doesn't matter if there's an injury. I just better have a band-aid ready. He says, come on, sweet, sweet. Come on, my little. And she walked over to me. He's like, let me get a band-aid for you. And she's like, that's silly. I don't need a band-aid. Look, there's nothing there. And as the story goes, his whole heart dropped. And he asked her, who told you that was silly? What he was saying is it is silly <laughs> to put a Band-Aid on, um, on your skin and there's no injury. He was like, but who robbed me and you? Who made you aware? Who opened your eyes? Who made you aware um, of the fact that it's not commonplace to put a Band-Aid um, on your body unless there's an injury? Who told you that? Who? Like, and it broke his heart because it was like, wow. This moment that we had together is officially over. Someone ruined that for me. Someone took that away from me. And he asked, who told you that? That's how God felt. It wasn't so much that you're naked physically. But who robbed us of our closeness? Who robbed us of our joy? Who robbed you of your innocence? Who robbed you of the fact that you're about to give up all of these pleasures, all the comforts of home, to now be thrown into a world of sin, naked and afraid? Who did that? And that's what happens to us when we let the enemy tell us things that are true, but don't represent how the Father feels about us. God wasn't trying to get them to not be more powerful than him. He was trying to protect them from hurt, protect them from sin, protect them from the evil and the wickedness and, and what we experience today. That's why he said, don't eat. When God gives you a no, it's not to harm you. It's to, it's to help you. It's to bring you good. His no is not punishment. His no is because you said, protect me from the hidden traps, God. His no is because he said, listen, I love you. I'm a good father. I'm a good shepherd. And so I'm going to watch my sheep. And if one walks away, I'm going to go after that one. That's his no. But we allow the enemy to tell us things that are not true. And so there they, there they stood before God. They gave up the comforts of home to literally be naked and afraid. And he said, because you know, because now you understand, now there is a punishment. You were punishment free. You didn't have to worry about it. You just, just live. Just live and, and tell me that I'm good. Just live and talk 
to me. Just live and have communion. And he's given us the same opportunity today. He's still telling us, hey, listen, your heart is exposed to me, whether you put a fig leaf on it or not. Like, I know your heart. You're already naked. But those who have accepted me are naked and unashamed because you know of my goodness. You want to expose your heart. You know who I am. I have proven myself. You are a believer. You know that everything is going to work out for your good. But, but when we allow the enemy to tell us we're worthless, which is what he was telling Eve, you're nobody, you know, you're, you're ugly. <laughs> I've heard some ridiculous, you're always, then we begin to believe what the enemy says, and then we begin to hide from God. I don't know if I'm worthy. I don't know if God's going to bring me out. I don't know if this is God's will. God's will is for you to prosper, not financially, but in joy. That's his will for you. And anything else that the enemy tells you is a lie, 100%. Who told you? You were naked. Who told you you were no good? Who is trying to, to strip you of God's grace? You may say, well, I thought we were under his grace. We are under his grace. And no one can strip you from the blood of Jesus Christ. But God gives us things that we don't deserve. That's what grace means. Giving us things we don't deserve. And sometimes God has to hold back that grace because of our disobedience to him. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. I'm still going to love you. I'm not going to strike you dead. You will replenish this earth. Like, I'm going to still be here. You will still eat. But now you got to work for your food. Like I'm still, but you, you stripped your own self of my grace of not having to work. Why we got nine to five? Because of Adam and Eve. <laughs> And then before you begin to blame Eve, Adam had a choice. And his choice was, am I going to obey the instructions of God or the instructions of Eve? And he chose to uh, obey Eve. Eve said, here, take this and eat. And he obeyed her instead of God who said, do not eat. We can't blame people for our choices. We have to take ownership. And Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. God was like, all oh, y'all going down. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> take ownership. That way you can live freely. You can be your heart, not physically. Please do not walk down the street. It's, it is illegal to do so. It's called indecent exposure. Do not. <laughs> do not. Let me see you run down the street naked. That is not what I mean by naked. But, but it's good to be naked before God. And, and, and God, here I am. This is who I am. Forgive me of my sins. Repent. Like this, is, you can't hide from him. And if you are naked before God and unashamed, that's a good thing. That's verse 25. But if you are naked and afraid, that's because you are believing the report of the enemy and you are living a life of disobedience and you are hiding from God. You are running from God. You are scared. Naked and afraid. I don't want to live naked and afraid. I want all the blessings God has for me. <laughs> they call it a merited favor because we didn't earn it. You know, when you go to college um, and they give you, uh, there's, there's two types of scholarships that they can offer you. They can offer you a need-based scholarship or uh, a merit-based scholarship. Um, a merit-based scholarship is saying based on your grades, based on your academics, based on your community service, based on your uh, class rigor, you know, the, the rigor of your work, we would like to offer you a scholarship uh, to, to attend our school. Uh, some schools say you have all the grades. Everybody that's in here has all the grades. <laughs> like everybody in here is a valedictorian. Like, so that's great. Um, we're not offering our scholarships based on merit because then everybody would get one. Ours are based on need. So there are some kids who have the right grades and their parents make enough money for them to afford college. Some kids make the right grades. They are excelling. They're on the same level of as, as the kids you know, who uh, are rich, but they don't have the funds to do it, but we still want to give you the opportunity because you met our standard. Um, and so those are need-based scholarship. Your family needs assistance coming to our school. 
let me tell y'all about grace. <laughs> uh, it's unmerited. These are unmerited scholarships. They're not merited ones. These are, we literally are on a need base. We need the blood of Jesus. Like we, <laughs> in order to go to heaven, we need the blood of Jesus Christ. And I want to live in the unmerited favor of God. I want to live uh, in the grace of God. I want to live in the obedience of God. I want to do as well. I do not want to live naked and afraid. I don't. Um, because that separates me from God. And if you've been separated from God, you know, you could just repent today. You can just, God, I'm a sinner. Don't blame. If if you had sent me different parents, if, if my dad was doing right, if my mom was doing right, if my boyfriend was, no. Take ownership for the choices you have made today and say, God, I am a sinner. I did what you told me not to do. I disobeyed your word, but I don't want to do that anymore. You can repent today. You might say, I've been a believer my whole life and I have step back into the world. You can do that today. You can say, God, I want to come back. I want to come back to you. He says, if you return unto me, I'm going to return unto you. Like, it's that easy. I'm, you don't have to go through no uh, hurdles and, and go through no hoops and hurdles. Not, no, he's that gracious. He wants us to be saved. He sent Jesus so that we could be saved. He took on the form of man for that very reason. And he's saying, so come on. It's not too late. It's not too late to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, to get back uh, in covenant, to get back in right relationship with God, to clothe yourself in righteousness, to take on that, take on that. I mean, Jesus is like, look, my blood is enough for your sins. And if you're living in sin and you're like, well, I'm saved, and you have no intentions of repeating, of repenting, and you just want to stay where you are in sin, we, we read uh, on a Wednesday in Bible study, mm-mm. You will not inherit the kingdom. You have to have the desire to live a holy life, to obey God, not man. So if you want to accept Jesus Christ today as your personal Lord and Savior, it is an excellent day to do so. We are running out of time, y'all. Uh, we got to accept Jesus Christ and not just say it, but we got to live it. It's got to be in our heart. Remember, our heart is naked before God. They never suddenly became naked. They were always naked. He just said, who told you? <laughs> they, they were. Our hearts are already exposed to God. And all he's saying is, I want to hear you confess. He just want to add him and say, God, I sinned. But he was like, it's her. <laughs> she told me to do it. She was like, the serpent told me to do it. God's like, no, take ownership. Take ownership of your sin. You made a bad choice. You made a bad decision. But the blood of Jesus will take care of it all. It'll wipe the slate clean. You can start over today. Even if you say, I'm, I'm saved, but I've been messing up. Wipe the slate clean. Start over today. Our parents messed up and he didn't destroy them. God is not trying to destroy us. He's trying to love us and get us to love others. Don't be naked and afraid. It's a ridiculous premise to a TV show, <laughs> but it is. It is representative of what Adam and Eve did. They left the comforts of home for nonsense. Um, and if you just admit that you are a sinner in need of the blood of Jesus Christ, if you believe that he came, he died, he rose again, um, he's, he's seated with the Father, and he's coming back for us. If you believe that and you choose to live a life for Jesus Christ, you are saved. That's all that it takes. And you can go online to know walk now what go to the bottom uh to best decision ever made and you can follow the tool there that we have to help you in your relationship with jesus christ um if you are in need of prayer or you have questions you can always reach out to us at no walk now what at gmail.com and we will be happy to pray with you and to pray for you um, or to answer any questions that you might have um, if all hearts and minds are clear let us pray Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you saying thank you for being God and thank you for being good. Thank you for second chances. Thank you, God, that when we uh, stepped out of sin, I mean, stepped out of your will into sin, that you were standing right there ready and willing to forgive us, God, and you have done that, God. Help us to, to just be, be who you called us to be, God, to allow you to order our steps, God. So that we can stay in right relationship with you, God. Give us the heart. Um, please have your Holy Spirit to remind us daily to pursue holiness in all of our decisions, in all of our choices, God. And when we go astray, because we will, God, 
Help us to get back on track with you. I thank you in advance for the healing that I know that you're going to do, God, that we have asked in Jesus' name. I thank you for uh, the burden lifting that you are about to do. These are all the things we ask and we declare in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I love you all so much. Thank you all so much for watching, uh, for supporting uh, what God is doing here in the ministry, both financially and prayerfully. For those of you traveling, we miss you so much. and We can't wait to see you. Please, please, please be safe. I love you all. Bye.